All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Resource Insider Podcast. And I'm sitting here today on a podcast that has been <clears throat> several weeks in the making with a new CEO, or at least a, a CEO of a new public company uh, that I've been getting to know over about the last year now. Uh, we met at, I believe it was Roundup last year. And I've been hearing a lot about what they're doing, and I imagine some of you have as well. And his name is Chad Peters. He is the president and CEO of Ridgeline Minerals. And I'm recording this on Tuesday morning, the August 18th. And Ridgeline Minerals listed on the TSXV yesterday, so Monday the 17th. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about that process. We're going to talk about what they're doing on their gold exploration projects down in Nevada. And we're going to get to know Chad a little bit because he is uh, one of the young and up and coming CEOs in the mining business. And that is something we like to talk about here at Resource Insider. So without further ado, Chad, thanks for taking some time out of your day to sit down and, uh, and talk Ridgeline. Thanks for having me, Jamie. So uh, for those out there who have not heard of Ridgeline before, and since you've only been listed for a day, that's probably going to be a lot of people. Uh, can you give us yeah. the sort of the 30,000 foot view of what you guys are doing right now and, and why people should care? Yeah, you bet. Okay. Well, um, I've done this enough time already I should be able to rattle it off by now. Uh, so Ridgeline is a Nevada focused uh, junior gold explorer. We uh, have a very large land package in Nevada, 116 square kilometers across three projects in both key trends. So we're in the Carlin and the Battle Mountain Eureka trend. And um, we have, a, I think we have what you can consider kind of somewhat of a unique um, kind of business model, I guess. So we, uh, we founded, I founded the company in 2018 alongside a, a longtime friend and drilling uh, contractor that I've known in Nevada for years named Steve Nielsen and uh, we actually founded the company together with the idea that you know how can we reduce risk to shareholders right I mean exploration is is can be a very risky game um, doesn't matter how good your project is so how can we reduce that risk to shareholders which in a really down market in 2018 when we started the company you know it, it was a tough time to raise money even with um, you know being able to come out and say you know hey we can offer uh, incredible drilling rates on all of our projects, meaning we can put more steel in the ground than anybody else. Even even when we were able to say that, it was still a tough sell back in 2018. So, um, you know, I think it's been a, a model that's working well for us. And um, I think it kind of separates us from the pack a little bit. You know, there's lots of explorers out there, lots of them doing good work. At the very least, you know, um, we like to think we are too, but we can also offer um, a significantly lower drilling rate and put more more money into the ground early. Okay, so wh how is it that you guys are able to drill cheaper, and what is it exactly that you're doing, and you know what is the what is the significance of this cost savings and dollar value? You bet. Um, so, uh, you know, every project's different. So to say that there's a flat cost that we drill at, um, you know, I'm not going to say it, it depends on you know are we drilling our shallow oxide project at Selena. Uh, for example, that's, you know, we're talking 300 foot holes, uh, maybe 500 feet at the most. I can, we can drill those holes for somewhere in the 11 to $12 a foot range. Um, essentially, you know, uh, Steve bought in early to the company, was the co-founder, and um, he's willing to drill what essentially cost um, to make this thing a go. So, you know, at Selena, we can drill for around 12 bucks a foot, depending on, you know, as long as mechanic, uh, we don't have any mechanical issues, et cetera. And then we head over to like our Carlin East project where we're drilling um, you know, closer to 3,000 foot holes, or I'll, I'll probably switch between metric and imperial uh, nonstop today, by the way. So if <laughs> I don't mean to, right? I'm, Can I'm Canadian and uh, ended up in Nevada. So, but um, yeah, you know, and for 3,000 foot hole, we're closer to maybe 21, 25 bucks a foot um, for our all in drilling cost, you know, kind of thing. So, still incredibly cheap. Um, you know, what that means, I think, in the early stages, um, two of our projects, uh, Swift and Carlin East especially, they're deep projects, right? So a lot of the reason why a lot of these projects haven't received um, a lot of drilling in the past was because they were, uh, you know, deeper, deeper targets. So we can come in, drill for like a 50% discount um, compared to previous operators and hopefully make a discovery. So that's kind of, the, I guess, the value behind that drilling contract. Okay, so you're able to operate more cheaply, uh, yep. but you know, 
just operating cheaply doesn't make an exploration project successful. Um, beyond uh, efficiencies in operation, you know, what sure. is interesting about Ridgeline? What are you guys actually doing in, in Nevada? What are you looking for? What's the strategy? What are you trying to accomplish there? You bet. Um, so we're looking for Carlin type uh, prod deposits. You know, we both, uh, myself and my VPX, Mike Harp, we've both dabbled in epithermals as well. Um, they can be pretty exciting, but for us, we've had our success on Carlin type systems in Nevada. So Mike and I have found between our little over 5 million ounces over the last five years with our respective teams um, between Gold Standard Ventures, which is where Mike was. He was the lead geologist on the Dark Star Discovery and uh, myself for Premier Gold. So what we realized kind of when we got together was, you know, Mike came in very early in the company uh, before we even did our seed round financing. And um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to focus on exploring these projects, um, you know, from a, a big picture scenario, right? So collecting all of the data before we even drill a hole. And I think that's what, uh, you know, the soils, the geophysics, the doing the mapping, building your geologic models. I think that's um, something, you know, I've, I've been guilty of in the past as well as, you know, drilling, drilling holes before they really were ready to be drilled. And, you know, you maybe you drill the wrong angle, maybe you drill the wrong depth or whatever, you know, but if you're not, if you haven't done all of that work to fully understand your target, you can be just taking uh, reckless shots with, with investor cash, right? So our business model is to have the cheap drilling, but we also don't do any of the, you know, we don't drill until we're hundred percent sure that this is where we want to be putting a hole so that we're putting our best foot forward with our drilling programs. So, you know, we've spent two years putting all of that background work together as a private company. And now we're mm -hmm. at a point where we're now using that drilling contract to advance those um, through this fall. So, you know, you mentioned Carlin type deposits, which is sort of the standard best known uh, Nevada type asset, mm -hmm. which, which so many of the big mines come from for, for those listeners who aren't familiar with Nevada. But, you know, you'd also talked about uh, exploring targets at depth and looking at for deeper assets. Uh, this is a little atypical for that part of the world, as I understand it, because uh, yeah. so many of these deposits are at or near surface. Um, obviously being able to drill at a, d a deeper, uh, at a cheaper cost, uh, you know, makes that more efficient from an exploration uh, perspective. But if and when these things become mines, uh, is that depth or that, you know, the potential of depth going to make it more challenging to uh, have these bought up by a major or put them in production or any number of things that you, that you would want to see happen here? Right. No, for sure. And I think that, um, that's a really good point because you can find all the gold in the world, but if you can't get it out of the ground efficiently, right, it's never going to be bought up. Um, so what we focused on is we knew that Carl and Issa Swift were both deep targets. So the only reason I picked those projects up was because they were in key trends directly adjacent to existing operations um, mm. with Nevada gold mines, right? So um, that reduces some of that operational risk already. Um, it's, you know, it's rate uh, within trucking distance. If you were to find a high grade underground deposit at either Swift or Carlin East, you can have that, you know, obviously your, your obvious buyer would be Nevada gold mines, but, um, and obviously, you know, it's all dependent on grade and tons, right? So, um, you know, I know that Barrick in general is looking for high margin deposits. They want to see, you know, greater than two, three million ounces of typically very high grade. And, and that would be on the low end. So, for those type of deposits, that's the benchmark of what, you know, kind of the minimum of what we're looking for is something that shows the scale to be of that size. Um, and then at Selena, that project is a heat bleach, you know, amenable to heat bleach um, uh, processing. So that one is kind of a little more wide open as far as who could pick that up because you don't need to have an operating mill nearby. Again, it just comes down to tons and grade, right? So, um, so but all of our projects have been picked up only, you know, in a sense, knowing that, okay, if we do find something, we already have a potential buyer. And it's, you know, if I were to, let's say we were to find a high grade deposit, you know, in the Southern, you know, down by, uh, you know, 50, 80 miles south of Long Canyon, well, that's not going to do any good for you, right? Because you can't efficiently truck it anywhere nearby to actually mill that material. So we were very careful about, you know, picking up assets that if we have success, actually could have potential to be picked up by these groups. So I think it's worth taking a step back now and kind of so talking about what actually is in your portfolio and what you guys do have planned uh, over the coming year. Sure. Yeah, you bet. Um, so like I kind of glossed over here a little bit, we got 116 square kilometer portfolio. Um, two of those projects, Carlin East and Swift, 
those were kind of the, you call it the flagships, whatever you want, but that's what we raised most of the money on um, back in, in 2019. Uh, they're both, you know, Carlin East is directly adjacent to the Gold Strike Mine and downtrend of uh, four kilometers downtrend of the Weeville operation. So both really obviously, you know, that's a very core position in the North Carlin trend. And we're the largest individual landholders uh, in the North Carlin trend outside of Nevada gold mines, right? So we think it's a very, um, a great spot to be. Swift is directly on trend of the pipeline deposit in the Cortez trend of the Battle Mountain uh, Eureka district. So um, both of those projects, you know, got a lot, you know, were very flashy early on from that standpoint of, hey, these are in, in you know, great, great locations and key trends. Um, and then Salino is, is a project that we picked up. And I think you and I had this conversation before, right, was our, the, way, the way our company, you know, kind of the risk profile of our company has changed dramatically over the last six months because what Selena brought to the table was uh, a very real oxide opportunity that we can really quickly advance. And, you know, you can start putting, you know, values on an oxide, you know, shallow oxide system very quickly. Um, whereas sometimes these deeper targets can be, uh, um, you know, it's tough to put a value on them at such an early stage because who knows how big they can get. Right. There's so many factors. So what we're doing this year is we're advancing all three. Um, they've all had the baseline work done up through this summer. And now what we're doing is we're going to drill 6,000 meters across all three phase one and phase two projects, respectively, um, across them. And, and hopefully what we can come up with is, you know, OK, which one of these projects are we going to advance aggressively? Um, which one of them? Um, maybe do we find a partner, you know, it, it all depends on and maybe one of them isn't panning out the way we hoped and we move it, uh, we let it go or we move it to another, uh, another company. So that's kind of the approach is, is get through this program, try to make, you know, hope that we make a discovery and then decide how we're going to advance these things. You know, we are a small company, so um, we can't just keep on advancing three assets at all in parallel indefinitely. Right. So. So basically you're trying to get a better idea of what you have, where the value lies. And then next year you can sort of uh, refine that program and I guess yeah. focus uh, budget and time on, on the, on the project that makes the most sense. Exactly. And the fact that we don't have any work commitments on any of the projects really allows us to be flexible. Right. So we can, I, you know, I like the fact that we can, we're putting the money in the best possible spot, not where it has to go to maintain you know, land ownership or, or whatever. So, and why is it you don't have work commitments? Do you own these projects outright? Did you, did you acquire them as an option from another company? What is the actual ownership structure here? Yeah, you bet. So we actually optioned this, these properties, um, Selena and Swift came out of EMX directly out of EMX royalty back in late 2018. And then mm -hmm. the Carl and East project was actually an introduction from the EMX team to some underlying landowners for that, uh, for that uh, Carl and East property. So we did it as essentially as one deal. Um, and what we did is we gave EMX 9.9% Ridgeline, which at the time we were worth 750,000 was our pre-money valuation, right? So it seemed like yeah. a heck of a good deal um, to give up 10%. And uh, they've been incredible partners. So we got, we got the project for 10% of uh, all three projects for 10% equity. On top of that, um, the other caveat of the deal was we had to raise a minimum of 2.5 million US within a three year period. And we also had to, uh, to go public. So essentially EMX just wanted to see, you know, make sure that we're raising enough money to actually do something with these things. And they wanted liquidity for their shares. So we've satisfied all of those aspects now. And so we're 100% owners. They retain a, a royalty on the back end, which can be bought down. Uh, it's 3.25 that can be bought down to 2.25. And, um, you know, they're a royalty company. So that was their, their main goal with, with this whole thing was to try to, to generate some organic royalties for them. So, um, and in our, my experience, you need to stay under 3% um, as a net royalty in Nevada, right? You know, anything getting up over three, you can start getting into trouble just as far as economics and stuff. So, so was, sorry, and you, you might've said this, and I might've missed it, but was Selena included in this package? No, this was acquired. Yeah. No, nope, no, nope, Selena was, sorry. Um, so Selena, but I was sorry. under the impression you acquired Selena at a later date after the initial two projects. No, actually, uh, that's just, it's just funny. I didn't have a whole lot of information, but I think I pitched you on it, what, about eight I months see. ago? So you'd always yeah. had it in the portfoio, but then we you sort of refocused we, on we it. We just didn't. On. I see. Exactly, okay. yeah. So we didn't, we you know, like, like I said, it was a tough time. So Selena, you know, people looked at Swift and Carlin East, and obviously, you know, the people that were buying into us early, they weren't generalists, right? These were, were very sophisticated mining investors. And they were looking at Swift and Carlin East and saying, wow, this thing, you know, this could, who knows what the blue sky on these projects could be, right? 
Whereas, um, you know, Selena was like, you know, everybody agreed. It's like, okay, it's an oxide project. It's probably not going to be 5 million ounces, but you know, somewhere, you know, I think it was, we hadn't defined what the potential was there yet. So when COVID hit, we readjusted. And so, well, you know, I mean, a million yeah. ounce oxide deposit at, you know, half a oh, gram or sure. more near service in Nevada is worth a lot of money. What's your exactly. market cap right now? 30, right or around 30 million, I think. All right. Yeah. So it could yeah. be worth a lot more than that. That's for sure. Exactly. And, and I think mm. the thing was, is we just hadn't defined what that potential was. And so we came back, we did all that work. We trenched, we hit, you know, 50 meters of point, uh, point six five or point six four gold and 16 silver. Um, followed up with some more, another trench of 38 meters of 0.75 and 49 silver across that uh, target. And we started realizing that this thing had some potent, serious potential. And we've been very quickly advancing that through a phase one program, which hit uh, oxide gold to silver in three or four holes uh, back in June. And we're now drilling okay. a phase two right now. So, and uh, we expect to have results in early September from that. And so come this September, you know, what are you hoping to be able to show uh, your shareholders and your potential shareholders and understanding that this is speculative at this point, and this is, you know, goal setting, and it's not, you know, a yeah. magic ball for those of you listening at home. Um, <laughs> really yeah, what are you trying to accomplish here? What do you want to be able to tell people next fall? I think what we, uh, what we really want to show to people is just that, um, that the that our model of our exploration model is is holding together right we want to be able to show people that all right we're advancing these projects um we're hitting you know we're doing what we said we're spending the money the same way we said we would and, and um you know if we have success at selena for example well that does a lot for validating our entire you know our our model for the rest of the projects as well right because selena was a forgotten about asset for 25 years um it's no different for swift or carlin east as well so if we have success at, at um, Selena, which I think will really help support the stock. Who know, then it really, I think, brings into the picture. Well, what what could they find over at Swift and Carlin East? Because those yeah. are certainly, you know, the blue sky on those. It's tough to put a, a value on, but they're they're we're looking for tier one assets at both of those projects. So you mentioned your model. You mentioned your model. Your model. What does that yeah. mean? Is this, in, <laughs> is this any way differentiated from the standard Nevada exploration model? you know, Carlin style, or are you doing anything different or are you kind of sticking with the standard Nevada playbook here, I guess? No, for asking. sure. I, I, I probably sound like a broken record there seeing the model. Um, you, we are, I mean, we're not doing, from a standpoint of the data that we're collecting, we're collecting the soils, the, the gravity, all that stuff, um, doing the mapping. And that's no different than anything that you'd find, you know, from a standpoint of any, you go talk to any good geo in Nevada, they're going to look to that as maybe the first step um, for an exploration program. The issue, the area where we're differentiated is you very rarely see a junior of our size ever actually doing that comprehensive work. Maybe they'll do a single gravity survey. Maybe they might do some field mapping, but very mm -hmm. rarely do you see comprehensive grav you know, geophysics, soils, mapping, and a full 3D model, which we have a closed 3D model on our projects. Um, you know, and, and, and I don't think like typically you don't see that. Um, and I think that's where we're a little bit different is we're just putting the money in early, which is tough, right? When you're a junior, you know, sometimes spending $200,000 in upfront work on a project couldn't be pretty difficult when maybe you only have a million bucks in the bank. But in our opinion, um, when you do that, you actually reduce your risk down the line when you actually get to the high dollar spending, which is the drilling. So if you're yeah. putting holes in the right spot, even if you don't drill one extra hole because you, oh, well, you know, the gravity says we should be staying away from there. That might have paid for your entire um, gravity, soils, etc., up to that point. So we like to think okay. that's a bit and of so that's what you've been up to basically the last two years leading yeah. up to this IPO, right? Exactly. And trying so to try. The question I probably should have led with, Chad, is uh, you know who are you and why are you <laughs> the right guy to be running this company? This sure. is your first public company. Uh, you know, I know you're what you know a lot of people in the space. We know a lot of the same people. I'm, uh, you know, colleagues of people on your board. Um, but, you know, for those at home, uh, you know, what is your background? You're an exploration geologist, but, you know, can we get a little more in detail than that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I actually, like I said before, I was actually, I grew up farm kid in uh, central Manitoba of all places. 
my hometown had like 14 people in it. So um, I'm not kidding. That was actually the number of uh, <laughs> and then dogs, of course. But so I grew up in a small town, pretty much just working on our farm, um, you know, kind of thing and, and um, playing a lot of sports because that was about all there was to do in, in Manitoba, right? So I actually had an uncle um, or a cousin, sorry, that worked for Chevron and, and you know, oil's kind of big in, this, in that area of, of uh, Manitoba. I grew up thinking, you know, by 16, I was like, oh, maybe I'll be an, an oil field geologist or something, right? You know, and and, mm -hmm. uh, and then I got into school and realized just how boring that actually was and uh, kind of <laughs> realized and then uh, was like, okay, well, maybe I'll try gold. So I actually ended up getting a summer position with uh, Premier Gold and uh, with Ewan Downey, his fresh, he just spun out uh, Premier out in Red Lake and got a summer job with him and, and um, really, it was kind of, a fun really fun start I mean Ewan was cutting core I mean like Ewan was the CEO of the company he was cutting core yeah. in the back shed I was logging uh um core in the front and it was it was a really, really fun. I think I worked like 80 straight days or something like that my first summer because I realized you know I found out that well you're paying me 200 bucks a day <laughs> you know like that's amazing that's more money and I've made my entire life so I just worked the whole summer pretty much and um, it went really well. Ewan paid for my school uh, to go back for my final year, graduated, and I went and started working for Premier uh, right out of the gate and uh, spent about five, six years bumping around every bush camp known to man in Ontario and, and the Arctic. And uh, then, you know, my wife started getting real tired of me being a part-time husband. And uh, that's when the opportunity to, to move to Nevada came up. And they said, well, you know, do you want to move to Geraldton to the Hard Rock Project? Or would you like to try out Nevada? And my wife was like, no, let's try Nevada. And so we gave it a try and we love it here. So um, that's where we ended up was uh, how we ended up down here actually, which is kind of a roundabout way. But, um, you know, I was- And are you Western. based in Elko? Am I right on that? Uh, Winnemucca actually. Winnemucca, so, okay. Have you been to Winnemucca? I have been to Winnemucca. I spent a summer working out of Battle Mountain actually. That's where my our office was for, uh, yeah, for the yeah. five years. Yeah. Uh, we might have even crossed, but you might have even been there when I was, uh, when I was Yeah, there. this would have been like 2007, 2006, somewhere, one of those uh, years. For sure. A little, little before me, yeah. Okay, fair enough. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so we worked there and um, we got to, it was kind of an interesting thing because we picked up the McCoy Cove project and that's kind of actually picking up McCoy Cove is kind of part of, I guess how, you know, my idea about Ridgeline came together was because this was a forgotten about project. Newmont had had it for, uh, 20 years and they actually picked it up only from echo bay back when it was shutting down only so they could take the uh the old infrastructure out of there they wanted the bulldozers etc and they were going to use it for the phoenix mm. mine it was just by uh, battle mountain you probably remember it the copper gold mm -hmm. uh, system so they hadn't done any work on it premier picked it up we felt there was some exploration potential still there and we ended up uh making a few different discoveries including the csd gap which kind of pushed the project over the edge for us we got it up to a 1.6 million resource um at about 12 grams per ton and that's when barrett came in and, and joint ventured it so got to learn a lot about you know nevada in general uh how those systems worked and i think starting my career in red lake made me not afraid to drill deep holes and stuff right like you you talk to you talk to you know old school geos in nevada still and they, you know, some of them still think if you're drilling deeper than 500 feet, oh my God, you know, that's so deep. There's no way you're going to be able to find anything, right? And clearly that's, you know, that's not the way things are working now. Barracks drilling, um, you know, 1500 meter holes at their four mile discovery and hitting incredible stuff. So, and they're touting that as their next tier one asset. So we made a deep discovery at Cove that became, uh, you know, became a barrack um, joint venture. And at that point I was kind of like, not really enjoying being the kind of in between between barrack i literally became like the you know our team would say well, why are, let's drill a hole here and then barrack would say no nah, let's drill a hole over here and i just became the middle kind of the middleman and, and it became a perfect opportunity to kind of uh separate myself from that i really enjoyed working with premier for years but you know the i had seen a bunch of projects kind of shake out of the new mountain barrack portfolio over the last five six years and they looked incredible no work was done on them and it seemed mm -hmm. like a great time to kind of pick up some assets at really cheap prices. And 2018 was still really, really tough. So um, that was kind of how we got the, the start and then partnered with Steve, the drilling company. And the projects you have now, the three assets, were they, did they come out of the Barrick portfolio and then get picked up by uh, EMX and then, yeah. then eventually you approach them? Is that how that happened? 
Yeah, so uh, Celine, uh, both Carl and Easton Swift were, you know, Swift was a barrack Placer Dome asset for years, it was part of the larger Cortez joint venture for 20 odd years. And then same, you know, when Barrick started divesting in 2010 of their non, I think it was 2010. No, sorry, a little later than that, maybe 2012. Uh, you know how they started divesting non-core assets, trying to cut down on their debt. That's when some of these projects started shaking out. Dumont was doing the same thing, which was the Carlin East project. It fell out of the, the bottom of the company, even though it literally, like I said, it's, it's right on, it's within four kilometers of a 15 million ounce gold mine directly on trend. So, um, you know, those two projects had fallen out and I'd seen those. I knew the BMX had picked them up because um, they've always been really sharp at picking up projects really quick. I think they staked it within, you know, a couple of days of when they fell out of those portfolios. And then Selena had been an old, kind of an old district, to be honest, of like of open pits scattered along the um, this end of the South Carlin trend. And same thing, EMX had had that for like four years. And that's the project I actually approached them about and said, because I'd wanted Premier to pick it up. Premier had grown so quick, become more of a kind of producer developer um, that it was too early stage for the company. So I actually approached uh, EMX about Selena. They loved the idea, loved the love the overall business model. And then they said, well, why don't we throw these other two assets in and kind of bundle them all together and we'll, we'll spin it out. So tell us for a moment uh, about your recent listing. So you raised, how much did you end up raising in the end? You bet. Um, so we raised, we ended up raising 5 million CAD and uh, we were initially targeting two or 3 million. And I think, uh, I mean, you and I chatted beforehand and we were trying to just stay conservative, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and and try to bring in two or three and then gold price I think took off like within I think it went well up over like 1900 bucks within the first two days that we were uh, you know raising and so we ended up getting over 12 million in orders um, in the first seven days we ended up up upsizing and, and um, bringing so we could bring in uh, the different institutions and stuff that expressed interest so now what we have is we have uh, 10 institutions invested in the company uh, we also have a uh, strong retail presence through the Haywood book. And then on top of yeah. that, um, heavy backing from our existing shareholders. Can you talk about some of the institutions you were able to bring in? Are you able to disclose that? Yeah, absolutely. I, there's a couple that um, I'm sure won't have an issue with uh, maybe an honorable mention, I guess. Uh, Paul Stevens uh, of Stevens Investment Management has been a big backer mm -hmm. in the company. Um, Porter Capital out of San Francisco. We have uh, multiple institutions out of um, Vancouver, um, some groups out of New York like Extract. Um, so we got a, a really good mix. We also have a, a couple uh, out of Toronto as well and one European group. So um, won't get into mentioning probably them all, but it, it accounts to about, um, I think around 19%, um, give or take of the company. So in that uh, spread for institutional, I think I'm looking, I gotta look back at the cap table here, but, uh, and then on top of it, management owns 17, high net worth retail would be another 54% uh, uh, percent, give or take. Okay, and then the retail, public, okay, yep, got it. Yep. And then the public companies would account for about, uh, geez, 19%. So I think I got public companies, uh, the public companies are 19, and I think the institutions are closer to 11. So who are some of the public companies that own your stock right now? You bet. EMX owns a uh, little over 7%. Yeah, Vior Inc., which is the hybrid prospect generator out of Montreal, they own another 7%. They've backed us right from the start, just like EMX. And Ethos Gold Corp owns uh, around 4% now, give or take. All right. And have yeah. you participated in all the financing rounds? Yeah, everyone. Too. Um, I think it's... Uh, getting my wife a little on edge at this point, we keep on pumping money into the company, but um, yeah. I've put about 150 grand uh, across all three, uh, the 20, 12 cent, 22 cent, and the 45 cent IPO rounds. So um, I personally own uh, rounds uh, non-diluted about seven and a half percent right now. And uh, yeah. then on, you know, uh, we've have a few options kicking in there as well. Our, my fully diluted ownership would be close to about 9%. So. Oh, well, that's a lot of money. And especially when, like me, you've spent the vast majority of your career in a bear market as well. That's certainly, uh, <laughs> it's certainly a lot been, of money. I've been, waiting it's, for, uh, I've, I've been waiting for it to get better for years and it just never did. So it's nice that it finally uh, seemed to turn, right? Well, it's not the, you know, I think you kind of made up for lost time with your first company listing on, you know, the day that uh, uh, Warren Buffett puts half a billion dollars into the gold space. I saw that. I actually, my wife called me. She goes, um, Warren Buffett just bought half a billion dollars of the Barrick stock. And I was like, 
I was kind of dancing around the office. It was it was a pretty good. Uh, it was nice to see because I mean I think I mean not, this is no nothing new, but it obviously is kind of bringing it to the generalist, uh, the gold out to the generalist now. And even my I think my my uncle mentioned that he's, he he texts and goes, "Hey, Warren Buffett bought gold." If, if my uncle who's a farmer in the middle of Manitoba is starting <laughs> to get you know if he's starting to look at it and go, oh, "Man, like you know, geez, maybe I should be buying gold," then that's pretty exciting. I think for all of us. Yeah. All right, so. $30 million market cap, 68 cent share price. Your financing was at 45 cents. Would right. you say all the money's been made here and no one should bother buying this stock now? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> or would you say there's still a lot of upside for potential investors? You bet. Well, I mean, obviously this opinion is my own, but um, no, I think that um, if you were to look at our peers, you know, like look at uh, BlackRock, for example, before they made that great drill hole uh, down in West Tonopah, uh, they were trading in the in a 40 million market cap range um, in a smaller land package, similar share structure, good management team. And think Andrew's done an incredible job putting it all together. Um, yeah. You know, but at the end of the day, they were trading in the 40 cent range. Um, same thing goes for Eclipse Gold, you know, same thing, right? Great management team. Obviously, those guys have done it before, um, but they're trading in a, in a 40 odd million market cap range. Um, so, again, you know, I, I, it's dangerous, I think, to start comparing too heavily to groups. But I think our peers in Nevada that are doing the same thing as us, which are, those are our closest peer group, actively exploring multiple uh, properties that's where we would be. So I think there's still upside for the company. And, you know, with all these catalysts that we have uh, coming over the next three months, you know, six, multiple drill, um, drill catalysts potentially at all three projects, I think that there's a ton of upside left for us. So for your investors that are in the, in the deal now and for people who are looking at coming in, this is the discovery story or a potentially discovery story. For those yeah. not familiar with uh, you know, the geology of Nevada, what does a discovery look like there? You know, you're going to go out and you're going to drill the shit out of these three deposits and what's got to come back for you to be excited as a geologist. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, I think, uh, it, again, it varies widely depending on whether you do an oxide surface or a deeper target, right? What defines something is really exciting, but, um, you know, what we want to see is, uh, you know, at least two to three holes showing good continuity of alteration and mineralization with some decent intercepts at, uh, you know, for example, at Selena, right? We hit nine meters of point, point 0.6 grams gold, 15 silver on the hillside. We're now testing the down dip continuity of that system into the covered valley. And um, what I'd like to see is two or three more holes at Selena, for example, showing solid, strong alteration across the right host rocks with some intercepts that, um, you know, some gold silver intercepts that actually suggest that there could be potential there. So I usually like to see two to three holes. Um, you know, if you're in the, looking at a gram, gram meter kind of, kind of uh, concept for an open pit, I'd like to see something in the 40 to 50 gram meter um, intercept for a shallow oxide system to at least, you know, say, hey, this has serious potential. Can you explain getting, to people what a gram meter uh, is? Yeah, of course. Sorry. So a gram meter intercept, um, you just take essentially the grade times it by the thickness of the downhole intercept. And that's a good kind of uh, bellwether, I guess you could say, for what the potential of those systems could be. And actually, um, the Kennerland team, I don't know if you read it, put out a really great um, summary of Canadian uh, deposits. And a big part of that mm -hmm. was um, what a gram meter intercept looks like on different scales of, of sizes of deposits. Um, so for, you know, like an oxide system, like uh, we're looking for at Selena, I'd like to see something in, yeah, in that 30 to 50 gram meters that shows good continuity of system. And, and these things require multiple phases of drilling a lot of time to figure out what's going on. So for a first phase, if we can prove, which I think we're already in that pre-discovery kind of phase, if you want to call it that at Selena, we've already hit trenches, mineralization beneath that. And now we're testing out kind of that next phase. Um, but I'd like to see at, you know, Carl and Easter Swift, I'd like to see at least one deep hole showing, you know, a 50 to 100 gram meter intercept, ideally, right? That would be kind of that same metric that I'd be applying. But because it's deeper and probably refractory, I'd want to see at least as a, you know, the first steps, I'd like to yeah. see an intercept in that range. And so yeah. for people listening at home, so a 50 gram meter would be something like, five grams per ton over 10 over meters would, 10 would go meters, exactly yeah. yeah and that would you know okay. that would be consistent with what your uh you know like for example i think our first intercept at cove the csd gap discovery that um i led with our team at premier i think our first intercept was 38 meters of seven grams right that was a really you know and that was an excellent yeah. uh 
drill hole, right? That right there was like, all right, where I think I got a $500,000 budget increase that day from the CEO. He's just like, yeah, keep drilling. Um, so, you know, if we were to get even half of that at Swift or Carlin East, that would be signs of a significant um, alteration, you know, Carlin system potentially being there. And we have a, a 16 meter intercept of 0.7 at Swift already that was drilled in 1999. So that, that doesn't quite hit the, hey, we're on to a discovery, but it does show there's a, there's some serious smoke going on. And I think that's what we're going to be following up on this year is, is trying to prove that, you know, let's follow that system, that intercept out along better host rocks and see if we can improve on it. So last Friday, I actually did a, a very long podcast with Francis McDonald from Kenora Land, uh, who you mentioned and who is a friend of mine about uh, this document that Kenora Land put out, which, you know, I'm calling, you know, their discovery metrics where they talk about, you know, what you need to see to, to really quantify a discovery. And, so, and that's going to come out before this releases. So it'll all, it, should all, it should all line up sequentially when you guys are watching this. Um, but, you know, something he mentioned uh, by looking, and now keep in mind they're looking predominantly at Greenstone uh, yeah. deposits in Ontario and Quebec. But he said, you know, you normally can't really accurately – and statistically, you can't really actually quantify a discovery until you've drilled about 4,000 meters of, yep. of drill hole. So you guys are drilling, I think you said 6,000 meters across all three projects. So if you're able to hit something solid with that, you know, I mean, that would be ahead of the curve. But also, it's probably important to note that you could walk away this summer, you know, assuming that's two, two and two, or however you decide to split it up with uh, you know, smoke and not fire, for example, but still a really good indicator that yes, you know, this is an area we need to be following up on and maybe it deserves another two or 3000 meters of drilling. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, like Cove is a perfect example, old mine site, they mined 5 million ounces of gold and then it went static for 15 years. And I think we probably drilled close to 40 holes before we tagged into the CSD gap and there was so mm -hmm. much smoke all around. You know, and it's exactly it. So I think you need to be objective. You know, the gram meter is a great metric for just at a very high level saying, hey, this is kind of hitting all the marks. But you have to apply exactly what the Kennerlin team said, right? You have to apply those, that, the, the geology to it as well and say, well, am I getting, you know, consistent smoke? If yeah. so, you know, is there a reason why? And should I be following up on this? Because just saying, you know, I think they said the average discovery is made by phase three, uh, by a phase three program. That's or right, 4, yeah. You know, and we're on Whoa. phase one. Well, go ahead. And they also showed outliers, right? That I think they used the David Bell yeah. mine and Humlo yeah. as the example, right? Where they had none of these metrics that they would have anticipated, but it ended up being a 20 million ounce deposit when all was said and done. World, world class, right? And I think, you know, Great Bear is another great example. That's an old picked over project. It had multiple operators over the years and look what they were able to do. So I think, um, you know, you need to stay persistent. And if uh, for us, you're looking for all those things, right? Like if you're seeing lots of smoke and you're seeing the right host rocks and all the right things and you're getting smoke, then yeah, we're going to take it past a phase three if we think it's warranted, you know, if we think something's there. Um, I think it's when the wheels fall off and you're like, all right, we've done three phases of work. We've tested every project um, that, or every target that we think, you know, could have host scale, you know, because I think that's the other thing, right? Is you can hit little thin intercepts, but if you can't show that that thing can actually grow, you know, what good is it, right? Like there's no sense putting more shareholder cash into something that clearly doesn't have the potential to be you know, an actual economic site. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think you need to be careful about how you assess the projects and we're pretty objective, um, I think at that. But yeah, the first pass that we're drilling this year is gonna definitely give us a really good idea of where we sit. And then, you know, from that point on, we're certainly haven't uh, hit that point where we're ready to walk from any one of those projects. It's just that first phase of, okay, where are we at? Can we test some of these concepts and hit some smoke, maybe even hit a great intercept um, and then take it from there. All right. Well, Chad, uh, you are two days into being the CEO of a public company. I'm sure <laughs> you've got to be a very busy guy this week. So I'm going to let you go. And besides, you got to go find a gold mine anyways. So you shouldn't be here talking to me for too long. That's uh, what my, my CFO said. He just said, go find, a gold <laughs> mine. go find a gold mine. Quit worrying about the stock. Before we say goodbye, though, is there anything else people should know about Ridgeline, about yourself and what you guys are doing? 
I think we, you know, I think we covered kind of bounced around a whole bunch and covered a heck of a lot of it, but I think, you know, uh, really just the main takeaway is we're a hungry, you know, hungry young group. Um, we're heavily aligned with, um, our shareholders and we just want to go out and make a discovery. I mean, we've been part of discoveries with our previous companies and we just want to go out and do it again. So I really appreciate you uh, having me on the show. It's been, uh, I think I've been bugging you for almost a year and a half now with uh, <laughs> sending emails and stuff like that about, uh, just the different shows you're doing and stuff. So I do appreciate you uh, making the time for me. Well, I'm excited to, to see what happens. So for those at home, this is Ridgeline Minerals Corp, RDG. Uh, and this is Chad Peters, the CEO. Chad, what's your website for people? Yeah, uh, ridgelineminerals.com. We have Verify uh, projects for all three sites actually. So if you wanna, you know, anybody that wants to go in, take a look at what we've done, make up their own opinion on what the potential is. It's all laid out there for you. And, Pretty great detail, probably more detailed than it needs to be, but we're a company run by a bunch of geos, so <laughs> there you go. But um, yeah, enough. that's, uh, and we're on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn as well, so. All right, thanks for your time, Chad. Much appreciated. <laughs>